All right, uh, thank you everyone for coming. Um, welcome to our special World Ocean Day event, uh, Journey to the Deep Sea, a special ship to shore presentation. Uh, we are coming to you tonight from SFU's downtown Vancouver campus on the unceded, unceded and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. Uh, the CCGS John P. Tully, uh, where the, uh, the, the Deep Deep crew um, is coming from, is, um, is on the unceded and traditional territories of the Haida, the Chalnuth, uh, Pachida, and Quatsino nations. But I first want to acknowledge that um, the scientific and conservation work being done in BC, uh, including that, including the stuff done by both CPAWS BC and uh, the government, takes place on unceded territory. Um, the colonial con uh, conservation we have undertaken includes violence, racism, and erasure. And as we collectively try to envision and start on a path towards um, an inclusive conservation movement, uh, we have to acknowledge that First Nations have endured and continue to steward and care for their territories to this day as they have done so uh, for thousands of years. My name is Arlo Acuna, um, an ocean conservation campaigner for CPAWS BC. Um, today, uh, June 8 is World Ocean Day. Uh, it's a time that unites the global ocean community from guardians to scientists, volunteers, youth, policymakers, and more uh, to celebrate, learn, and inspire everyone to work together to keep the ocean resilient and healthy. And we have something very special uh, to share with you today. Um, so for the past few weeks, uh, researchers from the Northeast Pacific Deep Sea Exploration Team uh, Neep Deep, or Neep Deep, as they like to call themselves, have been exploring the deep sea off the west coast of Vancouver Island. And thousands uh, off, the, yeah, so 100 kilometers off the west coast of Vancouver Island and thousands of meters uh, below the surface. Um, yeah, so for most people, this place is out of sight and out of mind. It's just that giant piece of empty ocean between us and our Hawaiian vacations. But that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, this dark, mysterious environment is filled with ancient underwater volcanoes, um, vents spewing hot, uh, super hot actually, mineral rich water, and weird and wonderful wildlife not seen anywhere else in the world. And now Neep Deep's exploration is helping to bring uh, this seldom seen and thought of uh, ecosystem to light. And in the near future, uh, this region will become Canada's newest marine protected area. Uh, Tangwan Hachuikak Sigis, uh, MPA. And it will prohibit bottom trawling, mining, oil and gas activities, and ocean dumping. It will also be co managed by the Haida, the Chalnath, Pachidat, and Quatsino nations uh, and continue the stewardship that they have been doing uh, for millennia. So our presentation from Neep Deep will be about um, 30 to 40 minutes long. And then there'll be um, a Q and A. Now I'll hand it off to the Neep Deep crew, the Neep Deep crew, on board the John P. Tully to show off uh, their amazing work exploring the deep sea. Take it away. Hi, just checking that you can hear us okay. Yes, we can. Fantastic. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us on this uh, wonderful day. Uh, happy World Oceans Day to everybody out there. Uh, my name is Dr. Sharice Dupree, and I am the head of the Deep Sea Ecology Program. I'm also an adjunct professor at the University of Victoria. And my job, if you can believe it, is to explore the deep sea and look for the amazing habitats and animals that live down there that are extra special and require us to care for them, protect them, and monitor them. So uh, that's a really fancy way of just saying, uh, I really love the ocean and I am so thrilled to be here uh, on the John P. Tully ship out off of Vancouver Island right now uh, in the middle of the ocean. And we've been here for about two weeks already. We've been diving every day and doing um, sampling every day. And uh, by any standard, I would say this has been a phenomenal trip. Um, it's not quite done yet, but uh, it's a highlight of my career for sure. And so we have a lot of discoveries to share with you tonight that are uh, brand new. And I won't say more than that because I don't want to spoiler alert it, but I'm going to uh, pass it off to my other co-host for the evening. And uh, I'll come back a little later and you'll get to meet the rest of the team. So I'm going to pass it off to Maranke now. Thank you. 
Hello everyone, I'm Ronke Harris. I'm a PhD student at the University of Victoria and I study hydrothermal vents and you'll learn a little bit more about those in a little while, but basically just seafloor superheated geysers. And now I'll pass it off to Rain. Hi, uh, Sinyaslas, good evening everybody. Uh, my name is Rain Boyko. I work for the Council of the Haida Nation as a marine planner and I am on board um, assisting with um, all of the amazing work that everybody's doing and also just observing all of the incredible things in the deep sea and in the territory that's going to be co-managed by the partner nations um, as well as the Haida Nation. So. All right, and I think we're going to jump right into vents. All right, so hydrothermal vents are basically, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, superheated seafloor geysers. They exist between 1,000 and 4,000 meters down on the seabed, and they actually form at mid-ocean ridges, most of them. So 65% of them are at mid-ocean ridges, where the tectonic plates are spreading apart and new uh, seafloor is being created. And they support thriving communities. So there is a lot of biodiversity in the image that you're seeing on the screen here and a lot of species abundance as well. And this entire community is thriving off of something we call chemosynthesis. And chemosynthesis is like photosynthesis. So photosynthesis is the process by which plants take sunlight and turn it into energy. Chemosynthesis is a process by which bacteria at the bottom of the food web here, sustaining all the life that you're seeing, um, take chemicals coming out of the vents and turn that into energy as well. So what you're seeing here on the left is two worms, and then we have some squat lobsters on the upper right and white filamentous bacterial mats, which is the bottom of the food web here on the bottom right. So vents don't always form vertical chimneys. They usually look like vertical chimneys, but they also, sometimes the flow can happen in a way that they jut out and form these horizontal flanges. And these flanges kind of look like this from the underside. So this was a really cool picture from one of our dives. And I wanted to include it because it kind of looks like a river tributary, but this is just the formations that is, are formed when the flow goes laterally instead of horizontal or laterally instead of vertically. Um, so vents have life cycles and they start out spewing this superheated fluid that can reach up to 400 degrees Celsius. And on this expedition, the temperatures that we measured were up to 300 degrees Celsius. So the next slide will just show you the temperature probe used by ROV Ropos, which is the remote operated vehicle that we use here, our submersible. And it was really fun to kind of guess how hot the temperature of a vent was before we actually put the temperature probe in it and realized what the actual true temperature was. So as I said, it got up to about 300 degrees Celsius was our maximum temp. And over time, uh, vents slow their venting. So they become inactive, which is what you're seeing here. Um, and my whole role on the expedition was to find active vents and inactive vents. And inactive vents are actually pretty hard to find, but we finally did find some perfect specimens. And that is the prop that I'd like to show you today, because this is a piece of an inactive chimney that was gathered on our last dive with two hours to spare. So you can see in it a little bit of glitteriness, which is the pyrite within it. And yeah, that's all I have for you today. That's my brief intro to hydrothermal vents. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Tammy Norgard and I'm one of the lead um, scientists on this expedition and we get to talk about this amazing discovery. So uh, a few years ago we came by this particular seamount called Tuzo Wilson Seamount, which we first of all had actually found. And that was um, a little bit of a challenge too because most of the ocean is not mapped. Once we found it, we put our drop camera down on it and just kind of did a drive by. What we saw, we were amazed by. And we, and this is where I'll jump into the streets, but we saw a whole bunch of skate eggs. And then we we had to leave. That was our last dive in that area and we had to leave. So we came back on this trip to, just to do a bit more exploring. We saw skate eggs and skate then, but this time we saw a pretty amazing thing. Thanks, Tammy. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm gonna share with you something that uh, is new to uh, film, is new to science, and we're really excited about because it required three things to happen all at the same place and for us to be able to go back and find it. So behind me here, we have the, deep sea uh, Pacific skate, and it likes to live deep down in the oceans, kilometers down. Um, their eggs that they lay have to sit on the seafloor, the cold seafloor, for up to four years to become um, skates. 
that's a long time to sit on the seafloor. So these skates have evolved to find warmer water. They, um, they can fly up to shallower water, following the continental slope, going to these seamounts. Uh, so that we know happens. Um, but what we weren't expecting to find is that on the side of Tuzo Wilson, there's this big cut in the seamount and these skates are coming up from the deep using this like highway, if you will, to get to the top of the seamount. And what we've discovered is the seamount is ancient, but it's actually still kind of active. So it's an active volcano that has venting hot water coming out of it and it that's bringing the skates to this area and they're laying their eggs in that warm water and we think that that helps the gestation period of the skates become shorter so that there's more chance that they'll survive and so um we didn't know that there was going to be venting here. We had the ROV, we had temperature probes. So we've actually made this discovery that there is a seamount in our water that's venting hot water, um, which is absolutely incredible. And I'm going to see if I have a photo uh, lined up to show you the next thing that happened. Okay, <laughs> so what we have here is a, a Pacific deep sea skate and it's actually laying an egg and it was coming down brushing the coral, coming close to the venting water and trying to pull this egg out of herself. And we filmed this behavior for about an hour. And as far as we know, it's the first time it's ever been documented, a deep sea animal depositing eggs in a coral garden, surrounded by warm water on an ancient underwater volcano. And we were just thrilled to be able to discover that and thrilled that we're going to be able to write it up in science and that we have the imagery to share with people so that we can make that connection with the public, that people can fall in love with the seamount, with this mother, with her journey and with delivering her babies to a safe place where they can grow. Oh, here's a photo of the eggs. And I'll just mention this is a close up of the egg here. We have a freshly laid egg that's the bright color and we have some darker eggs that have been there. Again, I said they can be on the seafloor for up to four years. Um, and what we were finding is, I think I estimated hundreds of thousands of eggs in hundreds of meters squared. So the density alone is um, shatters all other records of the species having a nursery ground. And that's us making the temperature measurements uh, when we discovered this, that this volcano was venting hot water. Okay, and with that, I'm gonna pass it off to two team members to talk about Tuzo, uh, sorry, not Tuzo Wilson, the cold seeps. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Georgia Clyde. I'm a physical scientist for fisheries and oceans Canada. I'm here on the survey to help with some of our mapping, data management, as well as some of the general logistics, like making sure our stream is up and running and uh, running around doing other things. So I'm going to talk a little bit about cold seeps. So cold seeps are areas of the seafloor where we have gas uh, and liquids coming up from fissures uh, in the ocean floor, but the water and the gas is actually ambient temperature. So it's not like a hydrothermal vent. So the bubbles you can see here are probably the same temperature as the seawater. And uh, yeah, so we came to this particular site, the Winona Basin uh, twin flares, because we had colleagues in October who came here with a multi-beam sounder and they drove over this area and they saw these huge signals in their map. And so we came back with our acoustic sounder here. And so you can see where you see these big uh, flares here, you have twin one and twin two. And so these are actually bubbles coming up from the seafloor towards the surface at over a kilometer. And so this is just a giant bubble stack. So it was about six o'clock in the morning when we saw this, we were super excited. We weren't even in the water yet with the ROV. Um, and we took a few things down with us in Ropo so that when we got there, we could take some measurements for our colleagues. So this is our very fancy checkerboard that we hold behind the bubble stream. Each of these grids here is about five centimeters and we use it to measure the rate of flow from the bubbles. And that tells us a lot about uh, the source from the seafloor and what kind of uh, seep that we're seeing. And the other fancy tool that we use is this upside down cylinder where we've drawn some lines on here. We hold it over the bubbles and we measure the volume. So how long it takes for the gas to accumulate uh, in the cylinder. And so I'm going to pass it over to Rain, who's going to tell you a little bit about what we saw once we were down there. So yeah, just another quick overview of cold seeps. Cold seeps are another chemosynthetic environment where um, hydrocarbon rich um, chemicals like methane gas or 
hydrogen sulfide um, escape from the seafloor, like um, Georgia was seeing um, through cracks or fissures that are typically caused from tectonic plate activity. activity. Um, so what kind of animals live down here? Uh, these are tube worms. Um, and so that's one example of a creature that lives here. There's also some snails, um, some whelks that live down here. Um, we found uh, also bivalve mollusks. That, uh, there was many clam beds observed in the area. And we actually um, found a really huge area that was about 83,000 meters squared um, large. Uh, roughly, and it was a huge bubble field. So there was a lot of those bubbles that you saw on the previous slide um, at just everywhere. And so that was a really cool discovery. So this is another creature that was down there. And um, this is a hagfish, sort of slimed on a fish and then swallowed it whole and then did this wriggling sort of knot where it was digesting or killing it from the inside. Anyway, it was a really cool kind of wild thing to witness um, in the deep sea. And so this is what um, gas hydrates um, can look like. And so we found many of these areas within this cold, um, cold seep area, there was a lot of these ice chunks essentially. And basically what gas hydrates are is it's when gas like methane gas and water um, freeze under pressure. And um, usually, like Georgia was saying as well, the water isn't a lot colder, so it's not like cold um, necessarily. It is cooler um, in temperature due to like the ambient sea temperature, but all this ice is formed through pressure. Hello, everybody. So how have we been doing all this cool research? We've been doing it with a remotely operated vehicle. We often shorten that to ROV. And we've been working with the ROV ROPOS. The ROV ROPOS, uh, we send down beneath the uh, the surface of the water, and it's controlled by a control van on the aft of the vessel. So we'll give you a tour later and show you where it's controlled from. But it has a tether that connects it to the shore, and the uh, ROV is drove by the pilot sitting on the back of the deck. And what's been very exciting about working with ROV ROPOS is that they can go up to almost 4,000 meters below the surface of the water. So we took it for the deepest dive that we could here in Canadian waters and went to over 3,000 meters. It was 3,200 and some meters below the ocean surface. We have never done that before in our program, so it was very exciting for us. This is an example of what it looks like in the control room. And this is the ROV ROPOS getting loaded off the side of the vessel here with its launching system. So this, uh, it was put, made possible by, um, they have modified the robot or the ROV to have um, pressure resistant uh, specific to the depth cameras, equipment, all their hydraulics are specialized for it. Plus they have a cable that can run us that length of um, water and it, the, the pilots are able to communicate to the submersible under the water. And our dive was yesterday and we went to over 3000 meters and I am someone who studies the taxonomy of the animals, what the name of the animals are, how they are classified. And I don't know how many times me and my colleague Merlin who's leading the taxonomy said, what is this? What is this? So we brought it up and it was a super exciting day on shore and um, it's all made possible by these deeply um, remotely operated vehicles. So you'll learn more about Ropos when we give you a tour. Hello, I'm Julian. I'm an oceanographer for Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And I'm Daniel and I'm a master's student at the University of Victoria studying oceanography, specifically biological oceanography. So since we were, since yesterday, we were at that, um, the deepest part of Canadian waters, we decided to do an extremely deep bongo net, um, which is a special net that you'll see um, during the tour, uh, which actually goes down and collects all the zooplankton that are in the water column. So we towed it from 3000 meters deep all the way back up to the surface, and we were able to catch tons of different, um, different diverse species and uh, almost in, in so many different phylum. Uh, and it was really interesting. Yeah, most notably, this year we've been collecting in the bongo nets tons and tons of salps. I'll show a jar right here. Salps are pelagic tunicates or sea squirts. And typically we find them um, in during years with oceanographic conditions that are cold or average. And it could be a good sign because oceanographic conditions that represent cold water years promote higher productivity and thus enable Canadian marine ecosystems to thrive. 
So another characteristic sign of cold water years is, as you can see in this jar, um, a bunch of red neocalamus. So those are these small, uh, these quite large little copepods um, that are actually filled with lipids. Uh, and that's what gives them this red color is all the little lipid droplets, with, droplets within each of the organisms. And because they're so filled with lipids and really fatty, we actually call them the avocados of the sea because they'll just float around out there being great snacks for um, many different organisms, many different uh, marine mammals and fish species and seabirds, everything like that. Yes, so um, Neocalanus is obviously a very, very important species of copepod that supports these higher trophic species such as Daniel mentioned seabirds, fish, mammals also support the whole benthos that this whole deep sea expedition is exploring. And so through vertical migrations from deep sea to shallow um, layers of the water column and through death and sinking to the benthos, they can support this whole marine ecosystem that we're trying to um, understand more and explore. So that's why zooplankton are important. Hello again. Um, so I'm going to set this section up and I'm going to say that as a scientist, uh, when I go into the deep sea, which is dark, we lose light uh, 100 meters down. Uh, we like to turn on all the lights. We want to see everything from the microscopic to the big guys, and we don't want to miss a thing. So what we end up with a lot of time is a lot of overexposed footage where uh, everything's just really, really bright. And that's great for science. Uh, but here on the Neep Deep Expedition, we try to take it a step further so that we can communicate that science with a broader audience. So uh, here I have our outreach specialist and onboard photo videographer uh, Nicole to tell us a little bit more about that and if you want to swap spots with me I'm going to do some flicking through the slides. Sure. Okay. Hi everyone thanks Sharice. Like Sharice said my name is Nicole and I'm the onboard photographer and videographer for the trip. For those of you that have been following the expedition for the last few years I'm the new Shelton this year <laughs> and yeah we've another priority of the trip in addition to all the amazing science and research and exploring and mapping that's going on has been outreach and communication to help tell the stories of all the amazing work that's being done on board and bring it back home to everyone that's on shore and so in doing that Sharice set up a lot of incredible Facebook lives where we've streamed to our dives every day to thousands of people around the world and scattered throughout the week we've had different outreach events where we have shared deep sea facts and knowledge with over 60 different classrooms which is pretty incredible Incredible. And yeah, while we are diving, another priority in addition to everything that we listed before is getting incredible footage, like we said, to help bring this uh, incredible work home. And so here we've got a beautiful whale fall, which when we were first approaching it, we were like, you know, checking out the different bacteria that was a part of it. And then we did an amazing thing where we switched into cinematic mode, where the lights go down super low, it gets all moody. We have a beautiful octopus here and in being able to prioritize some of the shooting we've stayed with a lot of these creatures to want monitor their behavior and watch them throughout their life cycle as they explore the deep we have some beautiful sponges here next we have yeah the nice close up so another great thing about this rov is the camera that it has on board and so we're able to get in super tight beautiful detail shots without actually disturbing any of the animal's behavior by getting in too close with the robot itself. Another beautiful shot here, nice and tight again, where we're not actually even that close. It's just the zoom, which is really incredible. Next one, we like to call this guy the disco worm. He's actually a scale worm, but blew us away with this incredible iridescence across its body and scales. And ooh, Last but not least, some of the deep sea footage has been so incredible and so mind blowing because this is a part of the world that goes so unseen that our chief scientist Sharice has actually been working with producers and directors at BBC to help take some of the footage that we've been shooting this expedition and include it in Blue Planet 3. So for those of you that have been watching the live streams throughout the day, some of the footage that you've been seeing might actually be on the big screen coming soon. I feel like we should talk about how fun. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. So the reason this whole expedition exists is because we are trying to provide science advice about these amazing deep sea ecosystems. Um, 
and so that we can conserve, monitor, and protect them and manage the oceans for uh, future generations. This expedition was a collaboration between the Fisheries and Oceans Council, Ocean Networks Canada, Quatsino and Patchy Dot Nations, uh, the Nuchalna Tribal Council, and the Council of the Haida Nation. A large part of it was conducted in what is proposed to be a new marine protected area called Tangwan Hachkwikak Sigis MPA. So it's very exciting time. And we've been working with a lot of amazing collaborators on shore. And, uh, but I would like to acknowledge that we've been supported here by the ROV Ropos and the amazing Coast Guard on the JP Tully. So I'm actually going to let you know a little bit about their perspective by passing it over to these fellas. So here we go. Hello, guys, uh, and happy World Oceans Day. Uh, my name is Matt Friesen. I'm a rescue specialist here on the Tully. And to my right, this fine looking gentleman is Tanner Arneson. He's the bosun's mate or winchman. Um, We've worked together for about three, four years now, and we've had the opportunity to work with uh, a bunch of different scientists doing a lot of different programs on the Tully. Um, the Tully is basically primarily a scientific research vessel, but uh, we also have the, we're on SARC standby at all times. Um, so at any given time, if there's a ecological or marine disaster, we can get uh, tasked to that. Um, hopefully it never happens, but, uh, Little info on the Tully itself. Um, it's approximately 70 meters. Right now we have uh, 23 people uh, as a crew and 17 uh, scientists. It's a, it's just a privilege to be a part of these expeditions and work alongside these amazing scientists. And uh, I think at the end of our careers, we'll be pretty happy and proud of uh, the work that's being done. The Tully in all her glory. Uh, so we operate uh, most of the equipment on board here, um, everything from operating bridge ops, uh, the giant crane there, that's this guy's job. Um, There's our A-frame that we drop our rosettes down and do the CTDs and the bongo winch. That's my room. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Chelsea Stanley. I'm on board as the oceanographic lead on this survey. I am a research technician with Fisheries and Oceans, and I am going to be your tour guide around our vessel. We've told you all about what we've been doing under the ocean and some of the work above, but uh, we'll give you a little insider's view into what our working conditions are like out here. Um, so I'm going to spin you around. Be prepared to be on camera, everybody. There we go. So this is our lab. This is where we spend a lot of our days. We don't get to go down in the robot, unfortunately. So we spend a lot of our time looking at computer screens. So this is our annotation station. This is where we watch the dives live. Hi, Cherise. And we are annotating as we go along important events, all of our collections, any animals of interest that we find when we start and end transects. And that data is all used later as they go through all the video footage in more detail in order to completely annotate all of our dives and make sure we have a good catalog of what happened. Let's take you through. Got our all important wordle board, keeps morale high. Coming over here, we've got our taxonomist. Give us a wave, Merlin. That's Merlin Best, one of our taxonomists coral and sponge specialist. We've got Heidi Gartner. You've already seen Heidi a few times here. Heidi's another one of our taxonomists. Heidi, what are you working on today? Hi, yeah. So we are working on, this is where we sort the specimens that we come up. So one of the cool things about having these robots with arms or ovaries with arms is that we can take either little steps of animals or whole animals up and do taxonomy or naming work and classification work on them. So a lot of the things in the deep sea we've never seen before. It's really cool. Or even if we have seen them, it's sometimes hard to figure out just from imagery alone. Um, I'll show you some of the highlights from the expedition. One of them is this coral, it's a precious coral. This is the first record in Canada. It's never been uh, documented in our waters before. And it's called a precious coral because it is related to the corals that are used from tropical areas that is used to make um, jewelry and that sort of thing. I'll show you one other fun one and before you can go on and see the robot. But this is actually a sea cucumber. It was swimming in the water column today when we sucked it up and brought it in. So what I'll do after we sort the animals, name them, is Merlin takes photography, and then I come along and I actually take genetic samples as well. So usually a tiny little snip of an arm or a foot or something like that. 
And this is important for research um, moving forward as a lot of this is new to science, our things that we're still figuring out about the deep sea. Thanks, Heidi. We'll take you through out onto the back deck and we'll take a look at one of our big stars of the show. Here is Ropos and we've got pilot Keith here to tell us a little bit more about the machine. Hi there. I'm Keith Tambury, the operations manager of the Canadian Scientific Submersible Facilities ROPOS ROV, the remotely operated platform of ocean sciences. And this vehicle has been providing all the beautiful video and pictures that you've been seeing over the past 10 days. So at the front here, we call this the business end. The business end has the manipulators and also if you want to come in just a little lower down there and look at that big glass dome, that's the camera that's been providing all the beautiful video uh, you've seen online here. We've got a, an assortment of other cameras that we use for working the vehicle. We have cameras on our arms that we use when we're picking up things. And it's all by the excellent execution by some of our pilot techs here. We've got Luke and Will, they're just working on a cable. And uh, we've got Barry, uh, Peter and Simon out here too, also helping uh, the scientists with their research and finding out all about these seamounts and the seeps. And uh, you can see the array of lights up top there. We've got three more cameras there. And then uh, the whole hydraulic system. Okay, these boxes have been the transportation devices for all the wonderful samples that we're able to get. And so we uh, have cutters that just take little pieces of coral and then we put them in these boxes that come up Then the scientists work on. Then we also have got our underwater vacuum cleaner or suction sampler, we call it, which has been working overtime this trip, sucking up samples and also what we call the suck and drop method, or we just pick up critters gently off the seafloor and deposit them into the box to be recovered to the surface. Perfect, Keith, thank you. <laughs> All right, we'll continue the tour of the back deck here. So we have a tons of room to work out here on the back deck on the tully. You can see we have pretty nice weather conditions today. I'll bring you around to show you some of the stuff that Daniel and Julian were talking about. So they talked about bongo nets. So you can see here, we have got a set of bongo nets. They are called bongo nets because they look like a bongo drum. There's two sides. One side we use to calculate abundance and the other sides we use for taxonomy to see what the different species are that are in the water column. And they've got a small mesh on them. So we get everything from small copepods all the way up to jellyfish. And we use these guys, they can go as Julian and um, Daniel told you, we took them down to 3000 meters yesterday. So they can go deep and sample all of those unique rare creatures that we don't get a chance to see very often. And then for the water sampling, a lot of the work we do on this survey is focused on what's on the bottom, what is living on the bottom, but what's a really important thing to those animals is the water that surrounds it. So if we like to know exactly what is in that water, the different chemical properties of the water that could be affecting these animals and their living conditions. So this is called a rosette water sampler. It's got an electronic CTD on the bottom that electronically measures things like temperature, depth, salinity, fluorescence. And then above it, we've got 24 10 liter bottles. These bottles can be snapped from the ship and we can actually close them at different depths. So bottle one could sample at 3000 meters while bottle 24 would sample at five meters. So we can discreetly sample different water depths. And from those, we take the water and we then measure it for oxygen concentration, nutrients. We check for environmental DNA markers. So we will take this water and we will catalog it in and see which animals DNA is floating around in the area that we grab that water from. We also will measure for things like um, chlorophyll and all these other factors that can have a huge impact on how the animals that live at the bottom are, um, are affected. So now we've got Ropo's working center. We've got their workshop and up there is the control center. I will quickly walk you up those stairs, show you what the control panel looks like. It's, uh, it's quite a show. Try not to fall. 
All right, I don't even know if anyone's in here. We'll see. Oh, there's Barry. So here we go. This is the control center for Ropos. Hi, Barry. So this is where the pilots operate the remote vehicle from, which is pretty amazing. Down at 3,000 3, meters of depth, they're able to manipulate those arms on Ropos and grab tiny little things off the bottom of the ocean. So lots of computer screens. They've got sonar to see what's coming up ahead of them. Lots of cameras. You mainly see on social media the front facing camera, but they've got cameras that face backwards, down, just so that they know what's around them at all times. And I think that's it for the tour. So I'll sign off here and send you back into the lab. So that concluded our presentation and our, um, our ship tour. And now we have the whole team, uh, you know, still in the lab. And we invite, welcome any questions from uh, the people in Vancouver or online. And we have a team of scientists uh, that are happy to take any and answer as best we can. So first one uh, we'd like to ask is, how do we meaningfully, meaningfully connect deep sea conservation with supporting surface marine biodiversity? So they, there's lots of stuff in the deep, but we know most of the stuff on the surface. How do we uh, connect that? How do we connect the deep sea to surface? Or oh, we're, we're jumping right into the science. Okay, well, um, while they seem remote and far away and deep in the ocean, uh, places like hydrothermal vents and chemosynthetic uh, places like cold seeps are actually themselves like a sun because they provide energy that's turned into food just like the sun provides energy that's turned into plant material and so it's creating a whole world down there around this energy source and as we study them more we see that they're not just feeding a world closed to itself they're not just feeding chemosynthetic animals and animals that are endemic to those areas but rather we see more occurrences of predators that roam the deep sea coming in, feeding on those animals and leaving. We see things like the giant skate that came in to lay its eggs there, take advantage of the healthy ecosystem so that its young could survive more. Um, we saw footage of commercial species utilizing the cold seep area, feeding directly on the bacteria, growing from those energy sources. So it's expeditions like this, and it's documenting how the food chain how the energy isn't just enclosed in a deep sea system, but how all these animals, be them commercial or, you know, wanderers of the deep or transient animals are using these places as important nursery grounds, important feeding grounds, important habitat at essential stages of their life so that they can be fitter animals and survive and wander the ocean more. So I would say that that's the best way of um, connecting the deep sea to the larger ocean is to look for those connections. And unless you're down here visually seeing them happen, um, it's a lot more convoluted. Uh, so that's why this uh, research is key for that. Um, does anyone else want to speak to it? I can say something. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> um, yeah, why? So the entire ocean is one connected ecosystem. So what happens on the surface is going to impact what happens on the bottom. So in DFO, we're collaborative. So we have a whole bunch of different research programs that cover surface to bottom, water properties, fish, everything's covered through our research, through ourselves and through our partners. So basically what this survey does is it gives the deep sea a face to the public. It lets you see what's down there and lets it, you see why it's important. But everything down there is impacted by everything above it. So we kind of all have to work in a team in order to make sure the entire ocean as a whole is conserved and protected. Um, I have a question from one of our guests on the internet. So you showed um, those uh, skate eggs uh, a few minutes ago. Do they want to know if any sea animals actually eat those skate eggs? I'm going to bring in Heidi with me. Uh, yeah, Heidi. <laughs> okay, so uh, we actually saw a lot of predators. There was a huge amount of biodiversity on that sea mount where all the skate eggs were, despite how deep it was. We were actually one and a half kilometers down. And so I'm going to pass it off to Heidi and see if we can remember. We saw predators. We saw crabs. Do we know what any of the crabs were that were there? 
Yeah, so in this deep sea environment, we did have some crabs where we witnessed predation. So there were um, the deep sea uh, spider crab called the long clawed spider crab there. And we witnessed them kind of pinching, pinching them with their um, sizers, their claws and getting into the egg casings that way. That's the only predation we've seen. Yeah. But the species that we saw on this cement are so um, poorly studied that we don't really know a lot about their predators and we don't really know what happens at these nursery grounds. So it wasn't uh, common that we'd see, you know, like something come in and pick up a skate and bite it. Um, the one thing that we would say is that the egg casing was very tough. It's made of like chitin, lots of chitinous material, but thick. So chitin is like what your hair is kind of made out of. So it's made by the animal, but it's dead. It's not living. The egg case, the outside of the egg case is not living and it becomes really tough. So it'd actually be pretty hard for some animals to get into it. Ooh, I, yeah. I have actually another thing to add that you've reminded me of is laying eggs in coral areas like we saw is very uh, beneficial to the animals because large predators don't come in you got to remember it's pitch dark down there and so it's almost like hiding something valuable amongst trees versus having it out in a field where anything could sense it uh, these eggs are dropping between crevices between the corals and sponges and they're actually like quite nestled in whenever we see them and the other thing i'll mention is that hydrothermal venting is actually toxic to a lot of animals. And so we were seeing lines on rocks where venting was touching. We would see no life there and then we'd see life beyond it. So if you're going to leave something on the ocean floor and you don't want it to get eaten for four years, hiding it in a coral garden among uh, hydrothermal vents is a good place because you're not going to have predators wanting to hang out around there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for uh, tag team tag yeah. team that one. Yeah. Um, hopefully uh, th that answers to that question. Yes, it does. That was a great answer. Thanks. Hi. Uh, do you see a lot of examples of bioluminescence when you turn off your lights? Ooh. Oceanography, is there a lot of... Yes, but... Okay, great. We'll get the oceanographers in here as well, but um, we saw a little bit of bioluminescence, um, but we don't often actually turn off our cameras because one of the things is, is that we've uh, paid for this very expensive uh, vehicle to come down and to show us what's there. So some of the things that we did see bioluminescence are things called tenophores. So you can also see them in the water column, but they create... Um, uh, bioluminescence on these things called their combs that are along their body and they flash so just uh, even along the benthos they were swimming by there's some bioluminescence in animals that we can't always see with our own eye as well so for example some of the sponges are really brightly colored because they can um, create their own light and some of the other animals uh, it's just really hard to see what other light on but there's some great papers out there on bioluminescence in the deep sea um, but I'll pass uh, this off to oceanographers so a little bit more. I guess I have something to add there for bioluminescence. We do see bioluminescence in the nets when they come up, um, particularly at night or when the lights are off in the lab. Um, and the bio bioluminescence produced in the zooplankton samples are typically by copepods. There's a species of copepod called Matridia, and they typically produce bioluminescence, but there's also tenophores that produce bioluminescence, like Heidi mentioned. Um, as well as phytoplankton, um, dinoflagellates put, produce bioluminescence. So it sort of depends where you are, where you're sampling, what the species composition is, but um, we do see it from zooplankton as well. Did the crew see any of um, the glass sponge reefs? And how can we in improve our... Um, yeah, so the glass sponge reefs are very rarely known. How can we improve um, the our strange and interesting biodiversity? in the public's eye and improve funding and outreach for that kind of stuff. I'll start with if we saw any glass sponge reefs. So glass sponge reefs discovered in BC is a very cool thing. So I'm going to give a little background on it. Sorry. Um, but they were thought to be extinct and existed back in like the Cretaceous period until they were discovered off the BC coast. So there are areas where um, these reefs are formed and they're estimated to be up to over 9000 years old. Now, what qualifies as a reef is that these animals make their body out of glass and it 
creates these really hard structures that when they die and their babies settle and grow on them, it kind of builds out in layers and layers and layers. So this trip out in Tangwan, Hachkrikak, Sigi, MPA, we did not see any coral or glass sponge reefs, but we saw a lot of glass sponges and doing what we call glass sponge gardens. So a lot of density of them all in one place. And they also, um, we also saw some of the species that are known to create um, glass sponge reefs, but they were all singleton. So they can also be on their own. Um, these are absolutely incredible habitats. Those weird bugle looking things that we saw in one of our slides, that's a glass sponge. And I don't know about you, but for me, it reminds me of something out of a Dr. Seuss book. Like how did he even know that it looked like that down here? It's pretty fascinating. And I'm gonna leave the second part of the question to my colleague. Thank you. The second one's actually pretty easy. And it was about how do we increase awareness? And uh, well, I guess that comes with funding. But really, it's the awareness part, and a big part of um, our work in the in our program here, and with our colleagues and our partners, is to share this information with as many people as we can. So that's why when we come out here, we make outreach and science communication a big part of our work. It's one of our science objectives. So we spend a lot of time holding these events, reaching out to um, schools, reaching out to classrooms, reaching out to everybody we can through social media, so that we can get you guys and people and people you know and people you might not know that online to uh, see what's out there and fall in love with the ocean. And that really does help. I would say since we've been at this for about seven years, we have um, definitely increased the awareness of the deep sea in the Canada Pacific. So, so I, I forgot another part. You shouldn't let me talk about animals very much, but um, the sponge gardens, I just also wanted to say, even though they're not reefs, they're not um, the same excitement in age and long-term, they are habitat forming animals. So especially when we see these coral gardens, we then see the biodiversity overall increase. So we've seen everything adorable from, you know, shrimp and brittle stars living in it within and amongst these animals, but also like we were talking about before, the skate ape coming in and just overall biodiversity diversity increasing. So they are really important um, areas as well, even though they don't classify as a reef. And yeah, the, the thing about connecting with you all is we're so excited you're here. We're so excited you're following us on social media because it's, um, you know, the deep ocean really does help benefit humans. Let's be honest, we're so we're selfish people. And um, a healthy ocean means healthy humans with better life. And so um, you protect what you love. And now you've seen a bit of it. And hopefully you're falling in love with the deep sea too. Awesome. Thanks, Heidi. And another audience question. Yeah, just a quick uh, conservation question, I guess. Um, what are the effects or are you seeing any of ocean acidification on the deep sea side of things? Yes, and I don't know whether myself or Sharice want to answer it, so I'll say the first part. So ocean acidification is a byproduct of what we call climate change, and what's going to be very interesting is that um, the first things that are going to uh, be stressed out by a more acidic ocean are things with hard parts in their bodies. So these corals and sponges that we're talking about, they're going to be some of the things that are first under stress. Um, but also, there's other side effects of climate change and Sharice loves talking about this one. So I'm gonna pass it off to her. <laughs> uh, I love talking about it. I wish I didn't have to talk about it. I wish it wasn't a thing, but since it is, um, we need to understand it. Um, Seamounts are a really fantastic microcosm to study for ocean acidification and also loss of oxygen in the ocean. A lot of the seafloor moves up gradually and things change slowly. Um, but on sea mounts, it's very steep. And these mountains come and transition through the water very quickly. So you end up having these bands that experience different conditions um, and you can return to those sites. So we've started to do that. We started to return to sites and monitor animals that live there, the corals and the sponges that Heidi was talking about. 
We also have been returning to the same places in the ocean and measuring the acidity and the oxygen there. And so unfortunately, um, a really phenomenal uh, line P time series that uh, is a Canadian based science initiative has recorded that over the last 60 years, we've lost 15% of the oxygen in our oceans. So that's our Pacific Ocean and ocean acidification has been rising. And so our CMAT program has been working with those oceanographers to identify what animals uh, live in those transition areas that are seeing the greatest change. And so we've started to return to those sites to see the condition and the abundance of those animals. And so on this expedition, we did that. We returned to some of those long-term monitoring sites and we are working um, amongst ourselves and with uh, academics to write those papers up. But unfortunately, uh, it's, not, it's not a good situation for them. Uh, but it's way better that we know that because then we can prioritize mitigating things that we can control and monitoring for the changes that are larger than the area itself. And so uh, the answer is yes, climate change is affecting the deep sea. I've mentioned acidification. I've mentioned the loss of oxygen, that uh, those are uh, key items for the animals. The other way that it's changing is that it's changing the food chain. And we've seen that out here too. We're seeing that food is coming in in different forms. And uh, if you think about it this way, uh, if you're an animal and you've had watermelon your entire life, a very long lived life, and all you've had is watermelon, and then suddenly someone drops uh, a squishy pyrosome on you from the tropics, you're not going to know what to do with that. And so changes to the, the food chain and the animals that we're seeing here too, uh, greatly affects the animals in the deep because that's, that's where they get their food source from is uh, the the shallower water and so if you change that food source in the shallow waters it's going to be delivered to the deep sea in a different way so um yeah i hope that answers your question uh, it's unfortunate to say but the, if you think about it, the deep sea is a very remote place there's not uh, any place of i know that on our planet um that is you know uh safe from that global change and it's important that we study it yeah on that somber note <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yeah, we have a whole bunch of questions. So um, yeah, okay. uh, our next question is another climate uh, change related one. Uh, we know that sea level rise due to climate change is already affecting uh, coastal land dwellers like humans. Uh, what is or will be the effect on coastal sea dwellers? Oh, coastal sweet. Do we, where is rain? Um, coastal. Well, <laughs> as deep sea folk, um, the change that they're talking about, I'm just, I'm going to kill time until we find a coastal person. Um, but in the deep sea, that kind of change won't affect the deep sea animals um, because the animals that we're looking at are two, three kilometers down sometimes. And so a change of a meter or so uh, isn't a lot to them um, as it is for uh, the coastal animals. Um, I will say... Uh, completely unrelated that in the history, the geological history of our coastline, we've seen extreme changes in uh, sea level. And some of these sea mounts out here, we know were exposed. They were islands once. And so we know in the extreme sense where we're changing hundreds of meters, um, it actually is the difference between something being a deep sea underwater volcano to a volcanic island offshore of the coast of British Columbia. Uh, so we have seen that, but that's more on the order of uh, 10,000 years and not in the order of climate change. Um, but, oh, I'm going to tag in Heidi to speak about coastal. Yes, the uh, only other thing I wanted to add about coastal and uh, sea level changes is that um, Climate change is affecting different animals in different ways. So for a lot of them, it's limiting them, it's stressing them out. But for some of the other species, some of these climate and coastal changes are actually beneficial to them. And sadly, some of those that are doing better are invasive species. So um, some of the animals that are likely to be transported outside of their native range into a new area. Um, a lot of them that survive and do well actually have, um, are, have really broad adaptations. And um, 
So things like some rising sea level will help them. And also um, with climate change, we're also getting more stratified water. So these animals um, that are well adapted to a wide range of, um, of you know, temperature and salinity can also do better. So that's one of the strange things that is associated with kind of these rising sea levels. Sorry, you, you talked to a bunch of deep sea biologists that went through us. <laughs> that's all right. That's a, that was still a great answer. Thanks, Heidi. All right. Yeah. Um, our next question, it looks like it's going to be an in-person one, but from online. Let's see if we can get Shelton on. <laughs> Hi, can you guys hear me? Oh, yes, yeah, Shelton, we can. Hi, everyone. How are you all doing? Good. I'm bringing in some of your favorite people. Hey, just hey, Sharice. Hello, everyone. Um, okay, so what's your question, hi, hi. boy? Yes, just for all the listeners, uh, my name is Shelton Dupree. I am Sharice's brother. Um, and uh, my question uh, is. Is the deep sea, and this is actually something I'm really genuinely curious about, is the deep sea very similar around the world or does it change quite dramatically like the oceans do near the surface? Wow, that's a genuinely good question. <laughs> that's not too shocked. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, thank you, Shelton Dupree, um, for that very insightful question. Um, I mean, it's going to sound biased because of where I am, but the ocean is extremely different around the world. The deep sea is extremely different. And uh, if you think about the expanses of a continent and how you can go from mountain ranges to deserts to hot springs to the coastal environments, uh, that happens under the sea, too. So the expansive blue surface that we see is a little bit of trickery because what it's doing is covering the very cool landscapes below. And all of those landscapes have animals and oceanographic um, activities that are happening at them that are as different than if we were on land. And the biased part of my answer is going to be that British Columbia just happens to have the coolest deep sea in the entire world. And uh, I am saying that as a scientist, not as someone who lives in BC. But uh, the answer is hidden deep within the earth. Um, British Columbia has the smallest tectonic plates in the world. It has the fastest moving fault lines in the world, which every so often shakes up our lives a little bit and... Uh, has volcanoes along our coastlines. Uh, but the other thing that it does is it makes for a very complex seafloor, one that you usually find in the middle of the ocean at mid-Atlantic ridges and mid-Pacific ridges. But on our coastline, we find that right off our shore. So if you get in a boat for a day or two, you can arrive at things that usually only occur in the high seas. And because those plates are very small and they're jostling around a lot, we also have some of the densest seamounts in the world. That's, um, that's the volcanoes. Uh, we have 66 and counting because uh, Chelsea by mistake discovered another one just the other night. Uh, we have 35 hydrothermal vent fields in our waters. And that's, uh, I'm gonna throw a little shade to the Atlantic and uh, the Arctic, but we're the only uh, ocean in Canada that has that seamounts and hydrothermal vents and so it's within our power one to protect them and two to study them uh, so if you are listening and you are in British Columbia you have something to be very very proud of because this is as BC as the Rockies I think the Rockies go into Alberta so never mind this. <laughs> but uh but also uh, if you're not joining us from British Columbia I'm sure you have a wonderful ocean too it might just not be as cool as that one <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I have to add something. Hey, Shelton. <laughs> Sharice was just Hi, Tammy. discussing hey, one of her, uh, re her research projects that we've had to do for the last five years and we haven't got around to yet, and it's modeling the seamounts. We're trying to find some similarities. We'll never get to visit all 66 seamounts, so we want to actually model the similarity. And she reminded me again just the other day that every time we go to a new one, we see something different. And that shows that even in can't, our, our deep sea, every one of these sea founts is unique and it comes in i go back to that story where we went to uh tuzo wilson to just check out one of the boring deep sea mounts and now it's one of the most exciting sea mounts we have so um i have to say that it's uh 
going to be a hard one for her. Thank you for the incredible answers. All right, we'll have going to try for another um, online question. Um, can we get Kennedy unmuted? Can you hear me? Yes, yes we, can. we can. All right, I'm not sure if this is a very intelligent question or not, but are there any big animals down in the thermal vents or just like small animals and plankton and stuff? Well, I'm going to bring over our hydrothermal vent scientist, and I'm going to say that's not, that's a really excellent question, because I actually don't know the answer. I didn't see any big animals, but I bet you there are. And actually, depends what you call as big, too, by the way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like bacteria. Yeah. So. <laughs> so I study the smallest stuff at the hydrothermal vents, but the smallest stuff feeds the bigger stuff, so I do know about the bigger stuff. You don't get anything too massive, at least not here in the Pacific Ocean, but you do, the biggest thing that we get are the giant tube rooms, and we don't even really get them up here in the BC waters. We get them down on the Galapagos Rift, so directly south of us, all the way south, um, and those are, the, those are about two, they can reach up to two, three meters tall, so the tube rooms that we've been bringing up from our vents or seeing at our vents are about 12 inches to 12 a foot and a half so in comparison to those giant tube worms that are down south that are about two meters tall uh it's a very big difference and that's the largest animal that i would know of at these vents and Charisse is gonna i oh, know you're sticking around because oh. <laughs> i would say that the most important and largest biomass animal is actually this animal that I care very, very deeply about. They're called microbes. <laughs> and I'm really surprised that somebody didn't answer with a microbe question because I believe that even beyond the vent surface, aren't they underground too? Like massive networks. But not everyone cares about microbes as much as me, but I'll let you take a stab at it. <laughs> so the reason why microbes are so important at events, other than feeding the entire ecosystem that exists at events, is because, well, the reason why I'm studying them is because they're very understudied in terms of environmental impact assessments. And environmental impact assessments are done for things like deep sea mining threats and other climate change threats. So activities that are going on down at the hydrothermal vents, man-made activities, environmental impact assessments search out at different layers of the ecosystem, how are different things going to be affected? But usually within those impact assessments, all we look at are the bigger things. So the tube worms, the crabs, the whelk snails, um, anything around that area and microbes are largely ignored. So my whole thesis is about infusing the microbes into those environmental impact assessments. Okay, and I uh, Kennedy, I just did a, um, a quick look and six gill sharks. We didn't see any, but we know they're there probably. <laughs> yeah, so we have about three or four more questions that I hope I can get through. Um, this one uh, is about, uh, is there any threat of mining um, here in the deep sea of British Columbia? And if so, what would the damage be like? Um, so short answer, yes, there is a threat of mining, but there are three different types of deep sea mining. So there's mining that goes on at hydrothermal vents and there they're after the sulfide rock. There's mining that goes on at, um, along basins with polymetallic nodules that are basically like rocks that you can pick up off the seabed. So with that type of mining, that's the largest threat uh, currently um, because there's more testing going on for that type of mining because it's the easiest to do. So it's kind of like if you were to put grains of sand on your dinner table and then go across a dinner table with a vacuum, that's how they collect those ones. Whereas at hydrothermal vents, they'd have to knock down the vent and deal with the high temperatures and the high pressures as well um, to get towards the metals and the minerals. And in short, if mining does go ahead, um, the effects would be absolutely devastating, especially for places like hydrothermal vents, where even the microbes down there, that would be the fastest growing resource, still grow much more slowly than microbes up here at sea level on land. Um, so it takes a long time for these ecosystems to build up and regenerate, especially if they're completely bulldozed over and removed. And I'll pass it to Street. Yeah, so I just want to bring it back to our local waters. And so those were gr uh, great answers. Um, so that's why the Tangwan Hachquika Sigis MPA will be so important because when in place, it will protect 100% of hydrothermal vents in Canadian waters, and it will protect almost 80%, uh, 90% of the seamounts. Um, and so within, uh, within the, the co-governance of 
the coastal First Nations and the federal government, uh, the Canadians have the, uh, the opportunity to protect these. And within these marine protected areas, there are a few key things that you cannot do. And deep sea mining is one of those things. Um, that's not to say that the high seas aren't vulnerable to it. And so in the North Pacific, way further offshore, the seamats there actually are under investigation exploration for exploitation and then south of us those uh, polymetallic nodules of south america are under investigation and there's multiple other places but those are in the high seas in canada at our seamats our hydrothermal vents we are doing the science here to advise on the protection that will hopefully keep uh, deep sea mining out of our waters ah yes I just want to add one last thing because I realized I told you there are three types of deep sea mining and I only listed two, but Therese reminded me of the third type as uh, seamounts and those are polymetallic uh, cobalt crusts. So there's poly polymetallic sulfides at hydrothermal vents, there's polymetallic nodules on the sandy basins, and then there's cobalt crusts that encrust our seamounts. And with that, I guess we'll take the next question. <laughs> All right, uh, here's the next question. Uh, what advice do you have for a teen who would like a career in studying the deep sea? And also, can we get um, photographer Nicole to also answer this? Um, yeah, what would suggest to someone who wants to do what she does? Hi, sorry, we all just ran outside because there's a seal um, in the water. <laughs> we just got back. Um, how do I do what I do? Uh, I actually came at this through kind of a similar feel to what we are shooting now. I went to school for biology, but I don't think that you actually need to go to school for that at all. Um, basically, my route was that I went to school for biology, and then afterwards, I kind of went traveling, started working for some nonprofits, and then really fell in love with storytelling because I started documenting the work that we were doing um, against plastic pollutions. And it was through that that I discovered this is how I was going to be a part of this movement, it was going to be as a storyteller from behind the lens. And so I think that if you want to get into this, all you have to do is find a local conservation story that you're really passionate about and offer to go and shoot it, whether it's for a newspaper, whether it's for a nonprofit or an NGO or something like that. Going and shooting it is a great way to start building that portfolio and getting practice shooting environmental stories to make impact. And then with that, you can like write grants and write pitches and do a whole bunch of things. And if you're very lucky, like I have been, then uh, some amazing people might give you an incredible opportunity to come and shoot the very, very important work that they're doing. My colleagues are coming up to talk about biology in specifics, but since the ROV pilots aren't here or the Coast Guard aren't here anymore, I just wanted to put, oh yeah, hey Tanner, Tanner can come back, but um, it's really special doing science work and our colleagues are going to talk about some of their experiences, but I also just wanted to highlight that you can make science or you can make your biology what it is or your career path like lean into your strengths. So for example, ROV pilots, they're very interested in how things work and how to move things around. And frankly, actually, if you're really good at gaming, video games, think about doing what they do. Um, and then, uh, yeah, there's so many different ways that you can contribute uh, to science. Um, you know, if you're an artist, that's a very important part. And a lot of it is about experience. So I'll get some of my more, coll more colleagues to cycle through. A uh, great question. Great question. Um, yeah, I started in a bit of a different route. I uh, grew up on a really small island on Haida Gwaii, and I started by just kind of looking at, like, growing up around um, sea life and actually eating it, harvesting it locally and traditionally um, with my family. So that's why how I started to get interested in o the ocean. And, like, I knew from a very young age that we needed to, A, respect the ocean and all the creatures within it, and then, B, that, like, how can we ensure this is going to continue for future generations? And so like from a very young age, those were the two kind of I thought about a lot and moving forward into my young adulthood, I decided to study marine biology. And that's how I started, um, you know, learning more about the science behind the ocean. Um, but from there, I kind of, I just really relied on my community and my family and the people around me and local knowledge. Um, so I was fortunate enough to grow up in a place where there was a lot of local knowledge, um, traditional knowledge about the ocean and the lands and how there's this really incredible interconnection between all of it and so um, I took that with me and then I went and studied and then I came back to my 
community where I chose to work and uh, now I work for Council of the Haida Nation, um, which is uh, really wonderful and it's been an incredible experience. So through the Council of the Haida Nation um, and through this partnership, that's where I got this opportunity to come on board um, with these incredible scientists and look into the deep ocean. Um, and of course, like looking further into how we can protect these incredible marine areas in the deep sea. I think I could pass it to another colleague. Thanks. All right, so I am not a deep sea biologist. I am a physical scientist who's very used to being on land uh, and working above water. It is an absolute team effort out here. And if you pursue what you're passionate in or, and the skill set that you have, um, that can be a very important part of these teams. And so I have a background in mapping, geography, physical science. And so I help out on this expedition with lots of our data, uh, mapping tasks, technology, uh, organizing, general labeling, um, all sorts of stuff like that. And so I think what Heidi said is perfect, just pursuing what you're passionate about. And then of course, you know, you've met Cherise, you've seen her once, she's very inspirational. So the first time I was exposed to deep sea science, I was kind of hooked on it. And so to be able to bring my skill set to that is just like, it's such a, an honor to be part of this team. And um, yeah, anybody else? Okay. Hello, you've heard from me before. You know, I'm a PhD student at the University of Victoria. But what you may not know is that I grew up in a landlocked area. So I'm actually from Toronto. So I guess lake locked, but there's Lake Ontario, but it doesn't really count in terms of ocean science. Um, but my number one piece of advice would be to not discount your own ability to find your own opportunities because I didn't know anybody in the marine sciences or anybody who wanted to study the marine sciences. And what I did was I got on Google and I spent hours and hours searching for different internships that would accept Canadians. Um, ocean science internships and the first one that I found and got was the Canadian Associates of the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences and that's the only Canadian intern the only internship that is purely for Canadians um, but there are a bunch of other options like there's one with Ambari in California in the south there's Moat Marine Laboratory in Florida um, where you're competing against Americans as well but you can get them because I got them <laughs> and um, don't discount being able to get that experience within the field because going into graduate school that really gives you a leg up as well so that's my biggest piece of advice search for your internship search for your opportunities and apply for things you may not be qualified for because you might surprise yourself or increase your skills for next time one from last one from the internet uh given what you have learned in this expedition what are the lessons learned and how does what has been learned in this expedition influence future expeditions and work? Oh, my goodness. But we just find out these things right now. We don't know yet. And that I, I think is the most amazing thing is, uh, honestly, we've been surprised on this trip. We went to hydrothermal vents specifically because we thought they were going to be, like, inactive and slow. And they were just popping up all over the show. And we went to um, a CMAT to learn why there were uh, skates there. And then we discovered the seamount was actually a hydrothermal vent too. Um, so what is gonna happen is we're all gonna get off this boat and we're gonna go back to our offices and we're gonna think really hard and we're probably all gonna write up some papers and we're gonna come back knowing this and fine crafting our questions for next year. But um, we're just as surprised as anyone else. And we've been studying these a year, five years, some of us decades. And uh, you come into the deep sea and you have everything flipped upside down on you in one expedition. And so I'd love to say that we had this all planned out and we figured out exactly uh, what we were going to see. And we went down there and we proved our hypotheses. But that is not what has happened here on this expedition. And isn't that fantastic? that the world surprises even like the experts of those fields. So um, we're going to dive again tomorrow. I don't know what we're going to find, but <laughs> we're going to dive again tomorrow. And then, you know, we'll probably be back in the deep sea uh, next year, the year afterwards. And uh, I hope that you'll continue to follow uh, the science uh, and see how it's influenced. Because honestly, it's the most fantastic part of my job is I just, I don't know, and I love it. Um, so tune into the dive tomorrow.
Uh, I just wanted to add something that I learned this trip, which is how important collaboration is. This has been a fantastic co-managed uh, led expedition. Um, we've also been really fortunate to have modern technology helping out. So every single dive, we've been connecting with experts on shore who are able to write us questions. We've also felt really connected to our global audience. We've had the opportunity to have like live streams of our dives to both Facebook and to our Ocean Networks page. And we've had people engaging and asking us questions and actually sometimes providing identifications of these animals. So I think that's what struck, strikes me and I think in the past three days I've heard quite a few times like teamwork make the, makes the dream work and it's been really really fantastic on board we've had um, members from Fisheries and Oceans Canada the Council of the Haida Nation um, university students oceanographers and we've been so well supported by the Canadian Coast Guard and ROV Ropo so it's been absolutely fantastic and for me that's actually the biggest thing I mean the deep sea is amazing but it made it all happen and on that note Sharice is making us all crowd in <laughs> Oh, Dream team. <laughs> this is partly why. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you for that fantastic question. And yeah, the deep sea is amazing and it's wonderful. Yeah. Thanks everyone for giving us your time this evening. I hope you had a wonderful World's Oceans Day. And um thank you to uh, Seaports for hosting this event so that we could reach um, all you fine folk. Thank you, Sharice. Um, yeah, so before we go, I um, just wanna share some links where you can find more information. So yeah, in the chat, we have been sharing some of Neep Deep's links. I especially wanna point you out toward their uh, Facebook page. That is where um, all the videos that you're seeing on the other screen or the third screen, uh, or that's where uh, they were, where the live shots have been um, as well. Uh, and you can probably see another live, uh, uh, a live uh, live stream of their dives uh, tomorrow. Um, if you want to check out more about um, the future Tongwa and Hachikwikak Sigis uh, Marine Protected Area, um, you can also check out our website, uh, deepseaoasis.com as well as there are other, um, you can also connect with CPOS BC on our website and social media. And yeah, lastly, I want to thank uh, the Neep Deep team and all their partners, uh, the Haida Nation, the Unitao, the Channel, Tampachita, and Quatsino Nations, Ocean Networks Canada, and Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Uh, to the Neep Deep team, um, happy sailings and yeah, get home safe. So yes, thank you very much and good night, everyone. <laughs>